Thank you, Jesus. If you're turning in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I am live. Once you get there, wait just a second. I know Pastor Nancy has a word this morning, so Pastor Nancy. Amen. Hallelujah. I think get this to turn the right way. Today is what we call Resurrection Sunday. And we think about it and we reflect about it, about what it means to us personally in our lives that we have been redeemed from the curse, that we have been set free, that we now have an assurance that we will spend eternity in glory with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We think about all of those things, but there is so much more going on today in this Resurrection Sunday. As we were starting to worship, I saw... And I attempted to draw it. I know the Lord has a sense of humor. I understand what that scribble was supposed to mean, but I would hesitate to show it to you. But what I saw was a straight, well, okay, straight line coming from the left and going to the right. There was a point on the this end, and there was a point on this end. And then there were little hash marks along the way that would denote like a progress point or a measurable place where you would come to that you would recognize you have come this far. And I saw at the last one where um, it was marked that it was my attention that we were at, I saw it was larger, and then I saw an arrow, yeah, an arrow drawn on it that would be designating moving forward this direction. But right ahead of that, I saw there was this barrier that was right there. And what I hear the Lord saying us today is that the barrier has been removed. The Lord says there has a place where you have come to where you have understood my kingdom to this point. And then you have pressed in and you have moved and you have made it to the point where you understand my kingdom and the functioning of it to this point. But the Lord says, I am placing within your reach the next step on the line of advancing, of fulfilling, of releasing, of demonstrating my kingdom. The Lord says, reach out and press into what is new to you. What I call you to, I have prepared you for. I have released all you need to reach into it. My arms are open to you, beckoning to you to risk what is new. Fear not, for I will be with you. There is much more that I have for you and am ready to reveal to you. The Lord says, forget the experiences you've had that don't line up with what my word says about my kingdom. Forget the thought processes that have been sent forward into your mind that tell you you're not enough, that tell you that's for other higher level ministers to walk into. Forget the failures where you tried before but didn't really succeed at the level you thought you should have. Forget the words that have been spoken over you by those who just don't understand my ways. Forget the limitations that people have placed on you that you may have placed on yourself. Forget everything that lies behind that does not agree with where I am telling you that I am taking you. The Lord says, as you've imagined in your mind, that line is a straight and flat line. Linear, not increasing in any depth. But the Lord says, actually, it is exponentially increasing for every move that you take 
for every time that you step forward your foot, for every time that you reach out, that you press into that which I have for you, know that I am exponentially releasing and revealing the power within you. As you trust me, as you obey me, I will cause the demonstration and the manifestation of my kingdom to be released. This is a day when the fullness of my resurrection power is, is crying out to be released. This is a day when the earth is groaning and reaching forth for it and saying, we need this now. We know it's time. Come, come, come. Reach out. Press in. I will not forsake you. I will not move away from you. I will not turn my face from you. I will stand with you, holding you, lifting you up, carrying you along the way as you reach in to that which is new, that which is being revealed of my kingdom this day, says the Lord. I feel like there's a, a time when we reach out to do something new that we get comfortable where we've been. We know there is new. We know there is more. We've never seen it. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know how to get there. But the Lord is encouraging, encouraging us this day that each and every one of us has a part to play in advancing the kingdom. That which you have been given is so special and so unique. And yet, if it's not in the place where the kingdom can use it, we are lacking what we need from you. So I just would encourage each and every one of you, Father, in the name of Jesus, I just reach out and I release comfort and peace and the courage by the Holy Spirit to reach out and do that which is new, that which has never been done before, that which is even beyond the ability to imagine or think what could be done. I, Father, I just reach out and I bind those limitations on their minds in Jesus' name and I remove them. In the name of Jesus. And I call you forth as the body of Christ. And I say arise. Trust me the Lord says. As I pull you forward. Into that which you were designed to do. In the name of Jesus. I just release the resurrection power. To each and every one of you. To fulfill your calling. In the name of the Lord. Amen. So be it. Hallelujah. When she was speaking, I started seeing an image of the original Star Wars movie. Oh, that was a good movie. And I remember the first time they went light speed or whatever, or what they call it? No, that's Star Trek. Come on now, keep it right. Amen. Where they did their hyper jump or whatever. And uh, they're getting all the coordinates put in. Everything's lining up and everything. And then they said, hit it. And when they did what messed up first time, but then when it hit, all of a sudden everything went just lines of light. Yes. Lines of light. And I saw that everything up to now has been getting all the coordinates put in place, everything aligned. And people can join in. But we're coming to a time we hit, we hit that hyper light or whatever it is, light speed. And it's hold on. It's going to be hard to just jump in. And so I encourage people right now. Game time is over. It's time to be about the Father's business. Amen. There's an all-in call right now. Are you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 yet? Praise you, Jesus. Go down to verse number 21. For he, Father God hath made him Jesus to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? How many know Jesus never knew any sin? But yet the Bible put in a, a caveat, an exception clause in the word, embedded in the Psalms. Anyone hung on a tree is accursed of God. And the only possible way that Jesus could take our sins was to be nailed to a cross, nailed to a tree. 
And so when he was, sin, because God had spoken it, came upon Jesus. And Jesus was born again backwards. Amen. He became what he had never been, a sinner. That enabled him to take the sin of the world, our sin on his, on his behalf, right? It says, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When we were born again, we were a sinner before, but we became righteous. We became made in Christ's image. The cross is more than just an icon we celebrate. It was a transitional point for us and the world. At the cross, Jesus was made sin so that three days later at the resurrection, we could be made in his image. We could be made righteous. Amen. Jesus was made what he'd never been so we could become what we could never be of our own ability. A new creation in Christ. In fact, verse 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new created being. Amen. Old things are passed away. There's that word you just said. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become brand new. They're become new. So if you've been born again, you're not who you used to be. I have people tell me quite often that knew me in the past and say, you're not who you used to be. I'm going, I hope not. I would, have, I would hope the blood of Christ had no effect on my life. I know it rebirthed me, but I want to get in agreement with that rebirthing and let the word change me into this image of Christ, right? So we became a new creation through the resurrection. Amen. And because we're a new creation, all of our dreams, focal points, all of our goals in life should be totally transformed. I mean, before you were saved, all of your goals most likely had a me mentality attached to them. What I want for my future. Here's what I want to do in my retirement. Here's the games I want to play before I die. Then I don't know what happens, right? But once you're saved, all of a sudden God gives you a new future. I mean, he made you a new creation. He ought to give you a new future, right? And there becomes a necessity to take all of your focal points, all of your dreams, all of your goals, and take them to your own personal cross, to the altar, or whatever, lay them on the altar, and say, God, I give you my future. I give you what I intended to do. Now show me what you want me to do. And God put in the word what he wants us to do. Amen. For all the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God intends for us to pursue being filled with his glory. Paul said it this way in Colossians 1.27. I'm showing you a mystery hidden from ages and generations. We may read this later. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you were saved, God put a deposit down inside of you. A seed embedded within your new reborn spirit. That you have the ability, the capacity to manifest the glory of God. And God's coming back for a glorious church in the end times. A bride with a spot or wrinkle. Who knows they are not who they used to be. I can remember way back when I was younger and I would meet Christians. I couldn't tell the Christian from the non-Christian for the most part. I mean, half my running buddies declared they were Christians. Oh, yeah, I go to church. Are you doing the same things I'm doing? Yeah, but I believe in Jesus. It was never meant, never meant to be. That, how can I say indistinguishable about who's saved and who isn't. The Bible says we're to be a peculiar people. The world's not going to understand us. We've got to be different. We've got to carry the power of God. We've got to manifest the very fruit of the Spirit, the love of God in our lives. And we've got to see God move on our behalf. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Amen? Now, we mentioned this. When you're saved... You become something you've never been before. In fact, up until the resurrection day 2,000 years ago, righteous man never existed. We could debate whether Adam was or not until he fell. But from the time of Adam, at least till Christ, there had never been a single righteous man born on the earth. Because all that are born of women are born into sin. You have that sin nature. But through the cross, God initiated 
a new species of being, a fleshly man with the nature of God inside. And because the nature of God is on the inside of them, nothing shall be impossible unto them. Jesus said after he rose, I gave you all authority. I've given you all my authority. Everything I do, you can do. Now go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. The gospel, not of just salvation, but of a new kingdom. That you have now the access to and the ability to operate in a kingdom that predates this universe. And all the power and provision, all the strength and joy of that kingdom is now available to the saint. And understand a saint is not somebody that's just attained some high level of holiness, done enough miracles or good deeds. If you are born again, saint is the name of you as a new creation. You used to be a fallen man, but through the cross, now you're a saint. Glory be to God. And God's calling us to rise up as saints and manifest his kingdom. There's been a lie sown into the body of Christ, into the church for most of the last 2,000 years. That even though you're saved, you're still some worthless, worthless sinner saved by grace. You know, all my righteousness is just filthy rags. I'm a worm before God. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Christ did not go to the cross, experience the most excruciating death ever formulated by man. Rise from the dead three days later after after having gone to hell on our behalf so we could be worms. The church has got to rise above worm mentality. Recognize we're to be God's representatives on earth. Not just because we carry some pious, oh, bless thou, you know, victim mentality attitude. It's because we carry the same power Christ carried. In fact, the word says the same power that that raised Christ from the dead quickens our mortal, fleshly, human bodies. Yes, you are human, but God deposited his own nature on the inside of us. And he says nothing shall now be beyond your ability to do and to manifest. What an awesome God we serve. So we discover at the cross we're new creations. But what God's been showing us lately, been showing his church lately, is he has another new creation he wants to raise up. There's another new entity he wants to manifest. Not of one person, but of a group of people. God's got a group of saints he wants to go all in. To say, God, what you want me to do, I will do. What I need to give up, I'll give up. Where I need to go, I will go. What you want me to say, I will say. Who I need to forgive, I'll forgive. What I need to sow, I'll sow. To say, God, I want to be fully invested in doing your will on earth. And Jesus is okay, because you are volunteering for me to use you, I'm going to take you through a training program, much like Esther went through to become queen. I'm going to take your life and start showing you the changes I want made within your your walk. The new mentalities you're to develop. In fact, the Bible says we're to take every thought captive. That's part of the training program. It's to learn to monitor what you think and only allow what aligns with the word to be processed in in your mentality, in your brain. Right? And, and, And that we're to walk in the fullness of the fruit of the Spirit. Totally led by the Holy Ghost. And God says, those that volunteer to go through this training program, that's what what I talked about, all the controls and components of going light speed or whatever being put in place. Then there comes a time God pulls the lever and the glory comes on that church, on that united group of people that manifests the fullness of His goodness. When we're coming to that time, we're on the precipice of that moment. God's about to birth A new creation called the Bride of Christ. Oh, do you see this? When God called Elijah through that vision he had to go down the river that got deeper as he went. And as the river got deeper, he came to a place where the river was so deep you you couldn't cross over it. You had to swim in it. 
And God said to Elijah, I'm sorry, Ezekiel, wrong name. Ezekiel, son of man, have you seen this? Because if you haven't seen it, you won't step into it. You won't move into what God has unless you know there's a, there's, there's a promise connected to it. And God's calling his church, the bride, to make themselves ready. To take whatever steps they have to to be this new creation. So we drew this picture on the board last week and I've, I've discovered that it didn't show up on the, the video last week. I had it moved too, too far to one side. So I've centered it more so you can see the drawing. What we have here is we have different aspects of the gifts of God provided to his people, his church. There are the motivational giftings. A motivational gift is the personality you were born with. It's who God made you. Amen? And so the Bible is seven motivational gifts. Exhortation, leadership, giving, service, mercy, teaching, and the prophetic. As primary giftings many people have. Amen. My primary uh, gifting is a teacher and then the prophetic. My wife's is mercy. She, she just leaves a wake of compassion everywhere she goes. She cries at a moment's notice, but she laughs in the same fashion. Amen. And you have your own motivational giftings. And God gave those to us uh, so we can bring those to the church and release them so there's nothing missing or nothing broken in the church. God gave me a word back in January, the end of January, that in the end times he's raising up team ministry. That as people go out and minister, it won't just be two going out, it will be groups going out. That there's not a single gifting left out. Not a single motivational personality not manifested. And in the church, we need them all. We need the teachers and the prophetic, but we also need the servers and the compassion. We need the leadership, the giving. Oh, every preacher's praying for the givers, amen. <laughs> Glory to God. So all of these giftings are necessary to have a fully rounded, fully formed church body. Amen. So it's bringing those into the house of God. And then there's five offices in the church. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Five usually full-time offices given to the body of Christ to lead, to release giftings, to release power, to uh, in, cause people to receive vision of what God wants to do. Amen. And God expects all those in the church. It's amazing in most churches today, they will believe in the teacher. They will believe in the pastor. They will usually believe in the evangelist. But then they'll say, but the apostle and the prophet have passed away. Now, here we go. The Bible says the church is built upon the foundation of the apostle and the prophet. And you just got rid of the two highest offices in the body of Christ. It will be impossible for that church to manifest the glory of God. Because it's missing components. It's kind of like you're going to make biscuits and leave out the flour. I'm sure Jana knows how to do that. She's got some substitute in there. But I was raised, you need flour for biscuits, right? Amen. If you put in cornmeal, it's cornbread. It's not biscuits. It's like leaving ingredients, the main ingredients out of any kind of recipe you want to make. You're going to make spaghetti without pasta. It's called ketchup. Amen. Or So we need all five of those administrative offices. But then the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is, or the gifts of the Spirit, I'm sorry. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, uh, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, discerning of spirits, working of miracles, gifts of healings and faith. Nine supernatural spiritual gifts he wants functioning in the church. Amen. And as we bring all of these into, we have a church fully equipped to manifest the glory of God. But what we brought out last week is, even with all seven motivational gifts in abundance, all five administrative offices in place, all nine gifts of the spirits manifesting and flowing, 
you still will not manifest the glory of God without one more component. There's another mandatory component required to move into the glory of God. And it's called covenant. I don't know if you can read that or not. Covenant. See, the Corinthian church had all of the giftings. But yet Paul said, you're still babies. I wanted to give you meat, but I can only give you milk. Because among you, there's still strife. There's jealousy. There's competition. There's trying to outperform each other. Right? He says, because of that, you're still not ready to grow up into the fullness of the image of Christ. I've got to give you some new fuel, some new food to grow up. And what were they missing? They were missing the teaching of covenant. How each of these individuals can come together and fuse. Remember we talked about in marriage, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. When a husband and wife come together, God does a miracle. They become one entity. Something is fused within the souls of mankind. Through a covenant marriage, they become one. And God sees them as one. And God wants there to be a marriage take place in the church. He calls us his bride. It involves marriage. He wants there to be an intertwining of these personalities, a connection of all these giftings that we're not here to one-up each other. We're here to exhort one another, to edify, to grow the body of Christ, to let these things mingle together. I can remember some of my relatives talking about making their spaghetti sauce. And they would take, you know, their tomato sauce or paste or whatever, and they'd take the onions and the garlics and the green peppers and whatever else they're putting in it and mix it all together, but it wasn't ready yet. It needed to set. It needed to set. In fact, they would may leave it for a day or two in the refrigerator for all these seasonings and say, and all the seasoning, all these things in it to intertwine so it become indistinguishable about the tastes. Do you follow me? Or I like to make guacamole. And you can't just take your avocado and mix all your stuff in there, you know, the onions and the lime and everything. You got to let it set for a while. Not too long or it'll go bad. But long enough for that stuff just to kind of What's the word I need? Through osmosis, just intertwine, marinate, whatever, becomes one. Then it's ready. And as long as we bring these giftings in here and we still have a me mentality, look at me, watch me, this is what I want, our giftings can't intertwine properly. They can't inter-infuse, if that could be a word. And we remain all these giftings, but not covenantly united together. And God's raising up a people, teaching them how to function in what, what is the most important principle of all the scripture, covenant, to come together and become one. And through that one church, he will manifest his end time glory. And what will happen is, what will happen is the church will become something it is, that has never before existed, even through Adam. Even through Jesus, the church will become something that has never before been. We will become the worldwide manifestation of the body of Christ. The bride. I'm sorry, the bride of Christ. A called out people that are all in, that manifest his glory. And we will become the church ready to be fitly joined to the Lord. Remember we talked about last week. That God commanded in the scripture, you're not to be unequally yoked. And Jesus is going to, he's going to obey that word. He's going to raise up a people that were all in as he was. How many know Jesus was all in? Sold out the whole route without a doubt. And this, it's going to be a people that, that, that are after everything God has and refuse to let anything of the word or any devil in hell stop them. And he's going to cause that group, that remnant church it talked about. Not the whole church, but a remnant group that come together as one. And that's the bride he's going to place his glory upon. Look at Revelation 19. 
just so I can show this to you. We're about to become what has never before existed. Yes. Pastor Nancy had a word on that a few weeks ago. We will become the new virginal bride, never before existed creation. Just like we were made a new creation when you were born again, God's about to bring us together as new creations to become another new creation that never existed, the glorious bride of Christ. And we will manifest the end time love of God. Oh, hallelujah. Revelation 19, are you there? Wait for me. And I'll be, I've got to find where I wrote this down. Verse number seven. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, to Jesus. For the marriage of the lamb is come. And his wife has made herself ready. She has made herself ready. It doesn't say God made her ready. It says she made herself ready. There's a part of the church that says, God, I want to be ready. I partner with you to make myself ready. Amen. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for white linen is the righteousness of saints. There's our righteousness. If you've studied church eschatology before, you know there's a series of events that are about to take place. One is there's going to be an uprising of the church to manifest God's glory. Amen? I believe part of that promise is they will bankrupt the devil. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. They will take back control of all seven mountains on the earth and bring in a harvest of souls like we've never dreamed possible. I believe billions of people will be saved in this last move of God. But then there's going to be another event take place called the rapture. A catching away of the glorious bride. And in heaven, it says there'll be, I'm sorry, on earth there'll be then started seven years of tribulation. Three and a half years of tribulation and three and a half years of great tribulation. I don't want to be in that. How about you? But in heaven, there's going to be a celebration called the marriage supper of the Lamb. That means the bride's got to be up there for the marriage supper. God's going to rapture the bride off of the earth. I'm not convinced the whole church is going. Because Revelation talks about there'll be Christians on earth during the tribulation. Who have decisions to make. And of course, after seven years, Antichrist is going to be about to destroy Israel. And Jesus is going to come back on a white horse along with us on our own horses. Mine will be orange. Hey, it's the glory. He's going to put down the Antichrist and the, and the evil forces of the world with the word of his mouth. And then we're going to go into a thousand years of peace. And of course, we go from there, right? Then another uprising, then a new heavens, a new earth. The point is, is I want to be of that bride at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But there's a need that we make ourselves ready. This isn't just about, well, I went to church. Well, I read the Bible. It's got to be about me and God. Are moving together in his plans, right? And of course, part of the requirement to be part of the bride is, listen to me, part of the requirement is you got to be fused to the body of Christ. An on fire church. You've got to allow your giftings God gave you to come in to be this new virginal bride. Because he's not marrying a bunch of individuals. He's marrying one. That new entity that's going to manifest in the end of the last days. Go to John chapter 17. This excites me. Because I know we're there. I know we're right on the edge of this thing. John chapter 17, now, we've heard of the Lord's Prayer, right? How many know the Lord's Prayer? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
If we don't pray, God's will isn't done on earth. Because Jesus said, pray like this, that God's will would be done on earth. He gave us the authority of the earth, over the earth, right? And we invite God to bring his power into our situations. But the truth is, John chapter 17 is the real Lord's Prayer. At least it's his last prayer we have record of, of any length. And I want to pick it up and start reading. Oh, it's all so good. Let's just start reading at verse number six. No, can't start there. Verse four. Jesus says, I have glorified thee on earth, talking to the Father. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, Jesus finished his part. I mean, on the cross, he said, it is finished. But understand, when he said, it is finished, he meant his part. He says, right here, I finished my part. He did not say, I finished all parts. Just like Jesus finished his part, we have to finish our part. Amen. You know, when you're trying to teach a young child, a little toddler, to put on his own clothes, or maybe he just wants to learn it himself. Have you ever seen the little two-year-old trying to struggle to put his T-shirt on? And, he, and you try to help him and go, no, I want to do it myself. And you're in a hurry, but you got to let them. You got to wait and wait and wait and wait until they're ready, until they do it themselves. As you grow up, you should be learning to put your own clothes on. It's a sign of adulthood, right? Another... <laughs> So is doing your part. You know, again, growing up the teenager, uh, make your bed, take out the trash, you know, do these chores. I got to do everything. I don't want to do any. Well, I mean, no, this is a sign of immaturity. But as you grow up, a child that actually grows up says, Mom, what can I do to help? Right? Dad, what can I do to help? Pastor, what can I do to clean your garage up? Besides, <laughs> I threw that one out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, no, we're talking about, you may not be, your faith not be, may, may not be ready for that level yet. Amen. <laughs> Once you grow up, you volunteer to do your part. So many Christians don't want to do their part. They just want, oh, God will do what he wants to do. Whatever he wants to do, he'll do. That's immaturity in the, in the body of Christ. So Jesus says, I finished my part. It's my goal when I get to heaven, I hear, well done, the good and faithful servant. Servant, you finished your part. Amen. He says, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory of which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus said, return to me the glory I sacrificed at the cross. See, he did more than just, how can I say, die for our sins. When he came to earth, he gave up his glory. What a volunteer. What a voluntary sacrifice. And he says, now give me back my glory. Why? I finished my part. So what do you think is coming on the church once they finish their part? This is our part. To let covenant mentality bind together all of our gifts we're functioning, or accessing by faith. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. There's a key aspect of finishing your part. you got to keep the word. But, of course, you got to know the word to keep the word. And the word is full of all kinds of, of, of requirements for us, all kinds of directives. Control what comes out of your mouth, right? you gotta get, you gotta, you got to learn to control what goes into your heart to control what comes out of your mouth. Of course, we mentioned control your thinking. Walk in love and forgiveness. 
there's, there's, there's specific demands placed upon us as New Testament saints. Verse 7. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. In other words, they've, they've come to realize you're the God of power. For I've given unto them the words which thou gavest to me. And they have received them. And have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. They moved into a realm of faith. A realm of believing God's a supplier. Amen. And Christ is the one sent from God. Do you believe that today? That's a mandatory requirement right there. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Amen. He's praying for those who will keep his word. But for them which is given, that was given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now here, Jesus says to the Father, what I have is yours, what you have is mine. You know what that is? It's covenant speech. That's when a husband and wife come together in the marriage ceremony. What I have is yours, what you have is mine. We're one. Paul even said it this way. The body of the wife doesn't belong to her, it belongs to the husband. Likewise, the body of the husband belongs to the wife. That's covenant. So Jesus here is speaking about covenant. And he says, And I am glorified in them. You look at a lot of the church, and I question whether they're glorifying God very much. When they'd rather claim sickness than they would healing. Poverty than abundance, sorrow than joy, and then declare half the gifts of, the, of God have passed away. Amen. The ones that glorify, for, glorify God lay hold on every promise of this word and then opt to manifest it publicly. They're not ashamed of the gospel, not ashamed of Christ. They're all in, in their pursuit of him. Verse 11. And now I am no more in the world. But these are in the world. Now Jesus had not been crucified yet. But he says, I've already, in my mind, I've already left. I'm, I'm coming to you. But these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. That they may be one even as we are. As we are. First of all. Jesus says. Keep them through your name. When a husband and wife marry. In fact it's been traditional for thousands of years. Since. I'm sure the first marriages. That the two that get married. Traditionally take on. One last name. I understand some people you know want to keep their last name, and I'm not trying to challenge that. My wife says she liked her last name better. Amen. I don't know what's wrong with shoot. But, but when we married, in one moment, her last name became Shoop. na 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 na, -na. <laughs> We became one. <laughs> Got to find another card on it. Became one. And because she carries my name. Everything that I have access to. She has access to. Do you follow me? It's not my house. It's our house. My car. It's all her cars. It's all her cars. It's her remote controls. It's all her chocolate. You know. And when God's. When Jesus says keep them through your name. Imagine for a moment, you carry God's last name. Because when you become in, became in covenant with him, you carry the name of Jesus. Right? The name of God. And you can say now, in Jesus' name. See, 
a lot of times we think we say in the name of Jesus, we're thinking because he's up there and I can use that authority, but because he is now in covenant with us, I'm going, you move in Jesus' name, who I am representing. Because it's a covenant. The authority that I carry, I carry because he gave me his name. But then he says, listen to this key, key aspect, that they may be one. Here we go. That everything they bring. See, we got all this through the name of Jesus. We bring this all to the table when we come to the church, which we're supposed to be part of. Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of such is, and so much more as you see the day approaching. The assembling, the intertwining of these giftings, the infusing, the coming together and being one entity, one, one united body of Christ. Don't forsake that. But we become one. It's this process right here. where Everything that's brought in becomes intertwined like the guacamole or the spaghetti sauce or whatever you're thinking you make. Almost like the sourdough bread where the leaven goes through the whole loaf, right? In this case, it's a good thing. Verse 12. You still with me? While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition. Who would that be? That's Judas. Son of perdition is the one he lost. Amen, who was a thief from the beginning, right? That the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, Jesus is praying, and these things I speak in the world. He's coming to the Father, but he's speaking into the world. That's our authority right there. that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now, see, that just ran contrary to about 80% of Christianity. My joy fulfilled in them. Because half the church looks like the sour pickle group. And the other half looks like if they smile, their face would break. You heard a cracking a smile? Their whole face would crack. <laughs> Do you understand how it, some people come in here and you're laughing before service? You're speaking. You're, you, you're not going to your seat and very quietly So thank you, Jesus. You're actually enjoying each other's fellowship that some people don't know how to, how to understand that. Because it's not that common. But we're to have his joy fulfilled in us. Amen. And if the heart of God, oh, I've got so many directions I could go. See, when you got born again, God gave you the heart of love. And love cannot be fully displayed or manifested without a target to release love to. God so loved the world, he sowed his best seed. To multiply that seed to have another group of targets for his love. He couldn't shed his love abroad upon the sinful world. He had to shed his broad up, uh, love upon a bride equally in his image. An all-in bride. And that allows joy to be fulfilled. See, because you have the nature of giving on the inside of you, for you it really is more blessed to give than to receive. It really is. I get much more joy out of giving things to people than I do getting. Except tools. No, just <laughs> Got plenty of tools. To give out of yourself to somebody else allows joy to be manifested. Some of my greatest joy is when I get to pray for people and see them healed. So into someone and see a need fulfilled. That's joy. Joy is the result of your reborn love giving nature having the opportunity to be displayed, to be released. And a joy of the Lord, the true joy of the Spirit, cannot be fully realized until you experience this the unity 
of being in a covenant group. Something I've shared many times. I'm, I'm getting behind, but bear with me. Pastor Nancy chewed up too much of my time, and I'm going to take it back. <laughs> now i got to remember what I was going to say. I attacked her, and boom, she's going out the door. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. It was so good, too. It was totally. Oh, well. It'll come back. Verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. If some of the world doesn't hate you, we're probably not doing something right. And because the devil hates you. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Jesus said, I'm not taking them out of the world. I'm, I'm going to keep them from the evil that would try to take them out of me, out of the body. Right? Still trying to gather my thought from a while ago. Verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, here we go. You are no longer of the world. Amen. The world is where you are abiding. But it is not of who you are. You're of a whole other kingdom. He's talking about kingdoms here. You're of a different system. See, in the world, it's the realm of, remember we've talked about it before. In the world, it's the realm of lack, pain, sorrow, uh, uh, competition, murder, that's all part of the world, even science. Some things falsely called science. But God's got another kingdom over here. And in this kingdom, you're no longer of the world. Now you have access to all the power of heaven. This is called the kingdom of heaven. There's joy and peace and love and healing and abundance and fellowship. All you'll ever need is over here. Nothing missing, nothing broken. And in between is a portal. Right between the world system and the kingdom system is a portal called the cross. And the cross lets you transition from one system to the other. And Jesus, even before he was crucified, was already prophesying. He was already prophesying his disciples would be part of that new system. Just like we're part of that system. You know, I'm trying to think how to put this. I have little desire to learn about something I will never need. Do you follow me? Uh, I'm trying to think of a great example. There's some new computer systems out there that are unreal I haven't learned how to master Windows XP yet I mean Windows 10 about threw me for a loop skip 7 it wasn't worth owning and and I don't care to learn about these new computer systems because I'm not going to use it people say look what my new smartphone does I don't care can I dial can I text can I put some that's all I need to know I don't want to learn about what I don't need anymore or not going to use. And I'm over in the kingdom now. I don't need to learn everything about the world. I'm shifting my focus to learn about what I'm going to use. I want to use the power of the kingdom. Do you follow me on this? God told me. It's been now over 30 years ago. Probably close to 35 years ago. He said, if I would trust him, he would let me pioneer the river of God in the end times. It flows through the kingdom of God. If I would trust him. That's what I want to learn about. We are no longer of the world. Now let's move on through here because I'm getting bogged down on this. But remember, Pastor Nancy took some of my time. <laughs> Verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 
Sanctify means to set apart as holy. Jesus prayed, set apart my disciples, those called out ones, as holy. And the word is a tool that will do it. You read the word, it's, it, it works to sanctify you if you'll submit to it. It'll change how you think, which will change how you act, which will change how you speak, which will change what you get. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, Jesus here initially was praying for his 12, right? The 11, I guess, at the time. In fact, at this time, Judas had not yet betrayed him. At least it hadn't been manifested. But he's already declaring he's a goner. He's praying for the initial disciples. But he says, I'm also praying for those that will believe their word. And a matter of, what would it be, seven weeks later? Some seven weeks later, there would be 8,000 people that would believe on their word, get saved. And Jesus said, I prayed for them too. But of those group, and of what the 12 went out and preached, or the 11 went out and preached, that was spread throughout the world. And it would, it would carry on for thousands of years, for 2,000 years. And there'd be another group in around 1900 and something, or 2000 something, that would believe on the word of Jesus, spoken by somebody else. And Jesus said, I'm praying for them also. I'm, I'm praying for the entire church through time. Look what he prays. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Stop right there. What is Jesus praying for the church over time? What is the one thing listed? He says, I'm praying for them to have. In his last prayer, Jesus gives, we have record of. He's praying covenant. He's praying the unity of the saints. They may become infused, intertwined. What's the word I want? Indistinguishable from one another. That a miracle would take place and they would become a new being. Just like at the cross I'm about to go to. Jesus said, I'm going to birth a whole new group of people that are new creations. At the end times, I'm going to create another new creation called the Bride of Christ that I can be fitly joined and equally yoked to. And look at the next verse. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. Now, first of all, he says, we're going to, they're going to be one just like Jesus and the Father are one. How close are Jesus and the Father? Indistinguishable. They're total uni totally unified. And he uses that as an example of how he wants the church to come together as one. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine us really come together as close as Jesus and the Father? It's beyond my comprehension. But he said, I'm going to give them something special to cause it to come to, ha to, to pass. And the glory that I give them will cause them to become together as one. This glory, which is the concentrated agape love of God, will cause us to infuse to one another and allow the glory to come in even, at even higher levels. And we will become the glorified bride of Christ. But you've got to start by bringing what you have, what God's given you, to the church. Say, God, I submit it to you. It's not mine. This is not my gifting. It's not who I am. It's what you, you gave me and who you made me. And pride's got to go out the door. It's all about him. He won't share his glory with any man. And the glory, read it again. Which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me. Whoa, think about that for a second. I don't know if I ever saw that before. Jesus said, here's you. Jesus said, I will be in them. And you, Father, will be in me. 
which means the Father is embedded within us. We're all in covenant together. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb, but the Father's in the Lamb. The two are indistinguishable as one, right? Separate, but internal unity. I and them and thou and me, look at this, that they may be made perfect in one. Perfect. You can't do it yourself. Only submitting to this process lets you achieve perfection with God. And the world, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou lovest me. When we come together as this virginal bride, harvest will be automatic. Amen? The glory will bring it in. I, uh, I'm not a natural evangelist. It's just not my personality. You know, some people have the ability that they never met a stranger. Amen. I've had people wish I'd stay a stranger. <laughs> then they'll say, and he's stranger. <laughs> I always blame it on geekism. Amen. I'm not a natural evangelist. And, and, but I remember way back, I, you know, I'd go testify on the streets. I'd carry the tracks. I'd go witness. People would be going out with us, and I'd go, and I never had any real results. And one Friday night, I went out with a group, downtown Lexington, and out. I get, are the fountains going? Triangle Park? Fountains are still there? Okay. I was out there, and a group of us were there. And this would have been probably 1991 or two, something like that. And the glory of God came on me. The agape of God came on me in tangible, concentrated level. And I'm like caught up with God. And I started witnessing, and I led five people to the Lord in 45 minutes. Everybody I talked to wanted to hear what I had to say. I went up to one group. It was a gang. In fact, it was a, it was a gang of black guys, and they were big, all wearing their vests and colors. I don't know what group they were with. I walked right up to them and started talking about Jesus. You know what was amazing? They listened. They said they're like transfixed. Who is this guy? He bold anyway. I don't know. He told him about the love of God and Jesus and, and, and went around talking to just groups of people, stop, start talking, and they all wanted to hear. And I knew it wasn't me. I knew it was that glory that was on me. And in 45 minutes, it lifted. And I was done. <laughs> now I'm stranger again. And... I'm going, God, what's this about? And he's saying, I want you to show you the power of the glory to bring in the harvest. It's not going to be about because you have the best tracks, you know, three colored tracks, and you have the best, you know, lines to convince people they're sinners. It's because the anointing of love is on you, and I'm going to use that to bring in my harvest. And this is exactly what Jesus is talking about here. The world will know that thou hast sent me. Verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I've known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Now, this is interesting, verse 25. Jesus, I know you. They know you've sent me. See, when you get born again, all you know is that Jesus was sent by the Father. But the goal is to know the Father like Jesus knows the Father. You start off just knowing Jesus was sent. But the goal is to manifest in your relationship where you know the Father too. And you move forward in His plans for your life. But look at this, verse 26. And I have declared unto them thy name. And we'll declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. The supernatural agape love of God is coming on the glorified church. But you've got to submit to the process. 
the bride has made herself ready. What an awesome God. See, so many Christians, the whole trip ends at the resurrection. Well, yes, at the cross, he died, but three days later he rose. It's finished. No, his part finished. Ours just began. And what an exciting trip to make. God showed me there's coming major challenges to the world. Major collapses potentially going to take place. But he said, my people that trust me, those that have moved forward in a relationship with me that want to be all I have, I'm going to put on a, on a speedboat. I saw a vision of a speedboat flying up this river, packed full of revivals, on fire Christians having the party of their lives, even though everything behind them was collapsing. And I'm going to be on that boat. How about you? You know why I'm going to be on the boat? I have a ticket. <laughs> Amen. Did you get a ticket yet, Nikki? You didn't get a ticket yet. Praise God. Anybody wants a ticket, see me after church. We got plenty of tickets. But the ticket's not enough. The requirement to be on that boat is to be all in with God. Amen. Did you get anything out of this? Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus. Communion, yes. Praise God. We're going to take communion. And you thought you were about to be out of here. I know you're wanting lunch, but we're going to about to give you some bread and, and juice. It'll hold you over until. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We are taking communion this morning. And some people say, how often do you take communion? Whenever the Lord directs. Well, I think you ought to have communion more than that. Well, you can take it at home all you want to. Amen. But this communion represents we're coming together as one. I want to get that much bigger. Hang on, I'm going to trade. <laughs> Hallelujah. Again, doesn't take much to entertain me. Thank you, Jesus. I want to read these verses. Well, I'll wait till our biggest served. Thank you, Jesus. Lord God. There's a strong presence of God here this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Wayne, won't you come on up here? We'll call upon you this morning. Just come around over here. Let me finish this and I'll call upon you. You can stand right there for now. Yes, sir. Let you kind of the anointing just seep into your in your being, right? Has everybody served? Nope. You came prepared, didn't you? By the way, I got to talk to you about a motorcycle battery after church. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. If you have a motorcycle, this is the guy you want to be united to, right? 
We ready? Nope, still going. I have no doubt that you do. Here, I'll bite half of mine. You can have the other half of mine. You didn't get served yet, did you? You didn't get served yet, did you? Yes. Go ahead and grab another one here. Right here about where it buried. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, Paul writes, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now let me pause right there. Jesus, at the Last Supper, take this bread. It's my body which is broken for you. Now part of our confession regarding communion is, is he took stripes upon his body so our physical bodies could be healed. I truly believe that's true. But I don't believe it's the primary message out of that. His body was broken at the cross. Do you follow me? Shredded by the scourging, the crown of thorns, the sword I'm sorry, the spear, everything about it. He nails, his body was torn apart. So the body of Christ, he'd be healed. Everything that Jesus did at the cross was an exchange. He exchanged his righteousness to take our sin. Right? He also allowed his body to be broken. So the body of Christ can be made whole. That's really what communion is about. It's not so much about, I mean, it does apply to our physical bodies being healed, but the communion was about the body of Christ becoming united. All divisions, all transgressions thrown out. When we become one. So when we take the, the bread, we're reminding ourselves, I'm one in the body of Christ. His was broken and now I'm whole. Don't let the devil tell you that you're not accepted in the church or, you know, you don't belong. The Bible says we are fitly joined. We're accepted in the beloved. And this bread is our declaration. I'm part of the body. Let's partake of the bread. My crunch was amplified. Verse number 25. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. It's the blood covenant he made. His blood was shed on the cross to make covenant with us. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. The cup represents the blood of Christ that was shed at the cross. Right? Even before the cross in the garden where he laid down his will. Not my will, but yours be done. And we know the blood is the power to forgive sin. Right? And we partake of the cup. We're reminding ourselves our sins are forgiven. And the sins of everybody else in the church are forgiven. Now, This blood has the ability to make you sin free. And if you walk around judging yourself after you've partaken of the cup, after you've been born again, calling yourself a failure, calling yourself a sinner, talking about all your transgressions, you keep reminding God, you know, I did this and I did that. You're declaring before God, this blood is impotent. It's powerless to change and deliver me. But once you realize you have the ability, if you're going after God, you can't do this willy-nilly or just intentional. But if, you, if you really go after God and try to live above sin, you have the right to say, God, I blew it. Forgive me my sins, and it's gone. 
But here's the other thing. Everybody else in the church, their sins are gone. And if you start judging people in the church, what you're saying is the blood worked on me, but it didn't work on them. Scripture says as you judge, you're declaring the blood an unholy thing. That lets us unite together. To see each other pure and spotless, righteous before God. Well, I know what they did. I know their faults and flaws. Just let it be filtered through the blood. And let it go. See them as God sees them. One in Him. And one in the body of Christ. Let's partake of the cup. I needed that to wash that bread down. Now, Wayne, what I want you to do is ask people if anybody wants to know Jesus today. In your words, testify whatever you want to do. All right. How's everybody doing? Boy, what a good-looking bunch of folks. You know, I can remember a long time ago when I was a really good-looking child. And I went to church, and I got a word from God. And he didn't tell me that I was going to be a preacher like Pastor Jack or a prophet like Pastor Nancy. But he told me that I was going to be talking to people and telling them who's who at the zoo. And when I went to the pastor at this church and told him that, he said, are you serious? He says, look at you. You're a biker, you're all tattooed up, you got long hair. What makes you think God wants you? Good point in the world. So I'll try to be brief, but I, I've got to tell you this. And it's a couple of things. It's about promises and what you know, okay? When you have kids and you say, hey, we're going to go to Disneyland. Oh, God, we're going to Disneyland. We're going to Disneyland. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, we can't go. Oh, man. What? You broke your promise? God does not break promises. What did he, what did he tell I, Abraham about Isaac? And then he had Abraham take Isaac up on the mountain. And right before Abraham offered that sacrifice, I'm paraphrasing a lot of this, there was a ram in the thicket. We all have a ram in the thicket, y'all, okay? God's promise will not be void to you, okay? Now, we're going to go about things that you know. I've had people tell me, they say, well, I know, I hear what you're saying about God, but golly, you don't know the things I've done. You don't know how bad I've been. And uh, I'm saying, yeah, you're telling Noah about the flood. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, that don't weigh nothing with me. God don't care where you've been. He's going to take you where you need to be. And these are things that you know. All right, so uh, we're all about the same age here. All right, you remember years ago, you know Mr. Whipple, he's going to squeeze the charmer. These are things you know. You remember Madge? Oh, Madge, I got dishpan hands. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, you're eating palm olive. Well, you're soaking in it. Oh, my gosh. You know, you think it's battery acid. But these are things you know. These are things you know. Tony the Tiger. Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. What are they? They're great. How do you argue with the talking tiger? <laughs> and then the real special one. You remember the delicious cookie, the Fig Newton, the big Fig Newton? Here's the tricky part. You know these things. So, but the most, one of the most important things that you need to know is what is this? This is the word. This is the Bible. This was a gift to me from my gorgeous wife and my kids 23 years ago. As you can see, there's Kentucky Chrome duct tape <laughs> and official Batman duct tape on the other side. This is mine. And you know what the word Bible means? I'm sure y'all know this. You get the cookie. 
you get the. <laughs> that is true. That is true. So another thing that you know, remember when you was a kid, we used to sing his song, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why do you know that? Because the Bible tells me so. I'm telling you, the teaching from this man, the prophetic word from this lady, is all grounded in this book. You're at a great place, folks. The word is being taught here, and the glory of God is in this place. The glory of God is in this place. And I've had people say, well, Wayno, man, I, you know, I'm smoking, I'm drinking, I'm looking at stuff I shouldn't look at, and, you know, I'm going to get myself cleaned up, and then I'm going to make a deal with God. Oh, man, that's more dangerous than having a copperhead in the outhouse. <laughs> Either way, it ain't going to be good, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you don't want to wait, folks, if there is something on your heart. And you may be saved, and that's wonderful. But even though we're saved, there are times when we may stumble. But the difference is, even though you stumble, you might even fall, pick yourself up, because God does not want to remember sins against you. He wants your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's, that's what it's all about. So I want to give you this opportunity today, if you would indulge me, Please close your eyes and bow your heads. And I'm not going to embarrass you. We'll never do that. If there was anyone here that would like to know the peace and the love of being saved, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Father God, I, I know, I know, these are things that I know. You died for my sins. I call you my Lord and Savior forever. I know that you died and you came back to life and you sit on the right hand of the Father in heaven and you intercede for me every day, every minute. And I pray right now, Lord, that you forgive me of my sins and I confess you as my Savior in my life. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hey, you're there. You made it. Ain't that wonderful? It feels good, don't it? Who, who, who? Feels good. Now, for those of you, like myself, you know, there's a lot of things. I am by no way means perfect. I know that may come as a shock, but I am not. And there are many days, just about every day, that I think of something or whatever. It flashes in my mind or whatever, and I have to say, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me of that. And I want you to know something that you're going to know. He will do that. All it takes is a sincere heart, and God will do the rest. He'll clean up your addiction. He'll clean up the things that's wrong in your life. He'll bring your kids back home, all right? He'll bring your kids back home. And all I can tell you is that it's a privilege and an honor to stand here before you, and I want you to know that I love you. And I want to pray for you real quick, and then I'll turn this back over to the boss man. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and the honor to stand here in front of these people today. And Lord, I just pray if there's anything, anything in their heart or in their mind that needs fixing, Lord, you fix this thing and you make it right because we know that you can. And Father God, we love you, we cherish you, and we thank you for all that you do. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for indulging me. My, notes. <laughs> My goodness, you had a lot of notes there. This is God rocks. <laughs> Father, in this church, I decree there's no sickness. No pain, no infirmities, no injuries that can stay. No infections. They're all removed by the power of the cross right now in Jesus' name. There's no lack in any area. No lack of finance, no lack of love, no lack of fellowship, no lack of opportunities. There's no anxiety, no oppression, fear, suicide, hopelessness, isolation. And there's no strife, no division, backbiting, jealousy, envy, 
jockeying for position. I decree the love of God rests on this church and angels go before us to make the crooked way straight. You bring in the harvest. You bring divine appointments to each one here to be a witness for you in these end times. We thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name.